to introduce the next panel. I'd like to introduce my uh, partner who will moderate the pa panel, David Pryor, who is a partner, as he mentioned, in our public finance department and a m member of the firm's healthcare, housing, higher education, and P3 infrastructure groups, as well as the Climate Change and Sustainability Initiative. Uh, I've worked with David um, uh, on uh, financing green infrastructure for, uh, for Philadelphia and trying to address some of the unique aspects in the, um, uh, of, of this uh, problem. And we're now going to hear both a success, an ongoing success story, and a, a story in progress. Uh, thank you. David? Hey, thank you, Bobby. I'm going to call our panelists up, uh, Joanne Dame and Carlton Ray from the Philadelphia Water Department and uh, DC uh, Water. Uh, first, uh, a couple of housekeeping uh, while they're getting settled. I want to tell you, especially for folks who are watching this by video conference, the questions for panelists may be emailed to green, the number 13, green13 at ballardspar.com. We'd be happy to take questions by email as well as uh, from the audience here. I also want to tell you that if you haven't picked up a flash drive, all of the materials, all the PowerPoints are on a flash drive. If you haven't gotten one, you can get one out in the, uh, in the corridor at the next break or after the uh, conference today. And we are doing a podcast of this conference, so uh, you'll also be able to, if you missed something, you can go back and hear it uh, again later. Um, I thought that uh, Bobby's uh, panel with, uh, with Alice and Wendy was terrific. I think one of the reasons there was there were no questions uh, was that they covered so much and they covered a lot of substance in their presentation. And uh, I was struck uh, as they were talking about uh, the topic of our conference, which is new opportunities and trends. And let me just say uh, this, uh, it's a World Series time. I listened to an interview of Reggie Jackson last week. Reggie Jackson, a great baseball player who played for the Yankees, hit three home runs in one World Series game. Something I'd like to see David Ortiz do tonight as a Red Sox fan. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the interviewer said to Reggie, you were always so big under pressure. How did you handle the pressure? Weren't you af afraid of failing? And Reggie said, no. He said, I looked at the World Series and I looked at each at bat as a chance for me to focus completely and be successful. And so that's the message I want to uh, give to our audience. What we need is focus on not the obstacles, but what we need to do to make the environment better, to make our lives better. We have to look at this as an opportunity to be successful in what we need to do. And two of the people who have done that are on the panel today. Joanne Dame with the Philadelphia Water Department is really in charge of all communications for the Philadelphia Water Department as far as I'm concerned. She's done a terrific job. And let me just say from a personal standpoint, Joanne, when Bobby and I were going to meet with the Water Department and to meet with Howard Newkrug about the green infrastructure program and stormwater regulations, I was a skeptic. I said that at our conference last year. And uh, Joanne was tenacious in the message and her passion for green infrastructure and how green infrastructure would not only be better, but it would be more cost effective and better for everyone, better for the environment, better for recreation, better in making Philadelphia a, a better place to, to live, work, and play. Uh, so thank you for that. Thank yeah. you for convincing nice me and, and uh, our firm to participate and help with the Green Infrastructure Initiative in Philadelphia. It's been a tremendous pleasure, very professionally uh, rewarding for all of us. And Carton Ray uh, is, is doing the same thing with uh, DC Water. Carton is in charge of uh, the rivers in Washington, the Potomac, the Anacostia, Rock Creek, and uh, trying to clean up the rivers in, in Washington. It's something he has a lot of experience uh, at as an engineer. Uh, Carton uh, graduated from Auburn and went on and worked even in New England when yeah, I think you said you actually worked in Rockport in Massachusetts before going to Indianapolis where you, you spent a good bit of your career doing for Indianapolis, what you're doing now for uh, DC Water. So I want to, I thought it would be, uh, in, in terms of the tale of two cities, I thought it would be interesting to have Joanne talk about what the Philadelphia Water Department is doing, what they're continuing to do with green infrastructure here, and then have Carton talk about what he's doing with DC Water and, and what DC Water is planning to do 
uh, to meet EPA mandates and clean up the environments. I do want to say one thing before they start. I think a lot of this, and taking advantage of opportunities, uh, is leadership. In both cases, in Philadelphia with our water commissioner, Howard Newkirk, he has been a, a passionate voice uh, for this initiative of green infrastructure. And the same thing is true with the general manager of DC Water, uh, George Hawkins. He's done a terrific job. They're national figures in leading the charge. So now let me turn it over to Joanne. Joanne? Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. I was going to start by sort of giving a, just a general overview about what's happening with the program itself and then a little history about how we got to the point we are with Green City Clean Waters and then just part of the program components to give you a general overview. So uh, essentially, a Green City Clean Waters program is uh, something that has been based on how do we re revitalize the city of Philadelphia using green stormwater infrastructure. And the re reason we got to that point was you know, we saw that we're asking our ratepayers for a huge investment in revitalizing our infrastructure. And, you know, Philadelphia is not a rich city. And so we had to use that investment really wisely. And what we were hearing from our ratepayers was that they wanted to see how their money was being invested. They certainly wanted to be, see results. But in the end, they wanted clean rivers, rivers that they could ac have access to, rivers that they could enjoy, that looked beautiful. And they also wanted to see these improvements happen on a sort of a year-by-year -year basis versus waiting until the very end. If we did some major capital, you know, traditional projects like tunnels or tanks, it would take a bit longer for us to get there. And so we, we took that to heart. Um, when we actually completed this consent decree with the Department of Environmental Protection of the state, uh, there were a number of elements to that consent decree. And so these, these requirements are very real, a little bit tough to reach, but you know, as David said, we have to have faith and we believe we're gonna get there. We're looking at this first five years of our program as sort of a proof of concept phase where we have an opportunity to install a lot of green infrastructure, make sure it works really well, adapt it, evolve it if we need to do that. But we also have some you know, very strict parameters that any consent order and agreement with the federal state government for the Clean Water Act would require. It established water quality based effluent limits, so we certainly have to meet, uh, remove 85% of the pollutants that a traditional gray infrastructure project would complete, so we have to do that with the green. Uh, we did have stream restoration in our original program, and actually the DEP took that out. But because we heard so much from our customers that they really wanted to see our Cobbs and Tacony Creeks clean and revitalized, we put that back in. So that's something we're still committed to do. It may take 10 to 15 years, but it was something that sort of rose to the top when we talked to our customers. In our negotiations with the DEP, this was originally a 20-year program. It became a 25-year program. Again, it gets down to the affordability. We looked at spending $2 billion, and we recognized that, you know, with the medium household income of Philadelphia, we weren't going to be able to do what we needed to do in 20 years, so we were given 25. And we did make the commitment to restore or, you know, reinvent 34% of the impervious cover in the city to make sure that it becomes porous using green infrastructure, a lot of the examples you saw some of the previous uh, presenters sort of share. An important component about this plan, it's adaptive. And so we are providing every five years, we have some targets we have to meet, but we're also looking at this plan on an annual basis because we understand that we may have to adapt, evolve, and manage this plan. If some things are not working, we might have to go with a different course. We may need to add a little more gray than we originally anticipated. That's certainly not the intent. But we recognize that we have 25 years and we have to make sure that this money is wisely invested and it gets us to the point we need to be. So this slide might be a little hard for you all to see, but the reason I like this one is because it really shows the, um, it's not, I okay, it's all there, okay. It shows the extent of time. This is not a plan that we put together sort of like two years ago and you know we sold it to the DEP and the EPA and they liked it. I mean, it really began around 1997, so more than 15 years ago. Um, Howard Newkrug, who is our water commissioner now, is really leading up this program. And he had this vision, you know, and uh, among other leadership in the department, that if we went with a traditional approach, we would have some real challenges because Philadelphia is downstream in all of our watersheds. We're in seven major sheds, either tributaries or rivers. And if our upstream neighbors were not doing something similar to what we were doing, we would not be able to see sort of the sustainable investment. So that was a real concern of ours. So with our original consent order, we had reached out to the state and said, we would like to do, certainly we understand we have to do some capital improvement projects, some of the, the ones that you expect, the basic ones like tanks or parallel sewers, 
but we also wanted to do integrated watershed management planning. We committed to do comprehensive characterizations for each of these watersheds, looking at physical parameters, chemical, biological, really getting an understanding about what the challenges were in these streams, identifying some actions to improve that, working with our upstream municipalities to create uh, implementation plans so that they were sort of mimicking the things that Philadelphia was doing and also taking a look at some of their own regulatory obligations. They had stormwater permits, they have total maximum daily loads, they had other things that they were dealing with. So we wanted to make sure our plan sort of took that in. Around the same time, so over that next 10 years, we we're also working with the state. We're getting growing greener grants, so we had an opportunity to do demonstration projects looking at green stormwater infrastructure. And I don't think we were calling it that back then. I think we were calling it environmentally friendly stormwater management practices, because I don't think GSI was quite, at least the terminology wasn't where it is today. So we were, we were practicing you know, these sort of programs in our neighborhoods, getting public feedback, working with our public partners, because we were looking at parks and recreation sites to sort of do some of this experimentation. So by the time we had submitted our long-term control plan update to the state, we had committed to do a number of alternatives analysis. We looked at the cost of traditional gray, traditional uh, a mixture of gray and green, sewer separation, and, and we really felt that the moving forward with the green, you know, taking the lead with the green, and then sort of filling in with gray was the best approach for the city of Philadelphia for the cost, for what we were understanding to get sort of like a triple bottom line, a real community investment, and also what we were hearing from our rate payers. So a component of that, we were required to go out to the public and present our plans, talk to them about all the things that we had looked at, and allow them to sort of weigh in and choose what would they like to see the city of Philadelphia did. And for the most part, resoundingly, we were hearing from the public that they did want to see us take this approach where they saw that their investment was on the surface. There was an opportunity to beautify the community, improve the environment, but also meet our requirements to capture the stormwater. Um, this slide just really shows like our watershed, watershed partnership approach. So you can see we have these seven major watersheds. It might be a little hard to read, but Philadelphia, again, at the bottom of these sheds. And again, we really were focused on putting as much of a sort of a comprehensive master planning effort together, adding stormwater permit requirements, adding total maximum daily loads. We did a, uh, Act 167 plans, which were the state stormwater management requirements, folded in everything we possibly could and created watershed partnership in each of these areas so that we had municipalities who were working in hand with us to implement the improvements that we were recommending and that they were also recommending too, so it wasn't just ours. Uh, so the Philadelphia plan, and, and it, basically it's, we did commit to upgrade our, our three wastewater treatment facilities. They have to take more wet weather flow, so we have a commitment to do that. We will be relining our interceptors. These are the major uh, sewers that line our Cobbs Creek and Taconi Creek to ensure that we don't have a lot of infiltration and inflow occurring. And then again, we have to manage one third of what we call the impervious surfaces in the city of Philadelphia to ensure that they act as Mother Nature would have them act, so that they are taking more stormwater into the you know into the earth versus getting into our sewer system, providing some additional capacity. The reason, you know, we call this an unconventional path, and there's certainly many cities that are looking to do that, including D.C., and I, I should say up front, we were not sort of like the brainchild behind stormwater management practices that are green. We talked to Portland, we talked to Washington, New York, Baltimore. I mean, a lot of people in Chicago, D.C., were looking at the same things, trying out the same things, so it was an, an opportunity to sort of partner also with other, other cities across the nation. But this unconventional, unconventional path was chosen by us for three major reasons. You know, I, I mentioned the affordability component. If we did tunnels along the Delaware, the Schuylkill, the Cops, Dakota, that would have cost us about $9 billion. You know, and that's $9 billion that our ratepayers could not afford. And the other thing was that we, they would not see an immediate investment. We like the idea of having year-by-year -year improvements in water quality, in, in what was happening in the communities, versus having to wait until every time a tunnel is completed to see any kind of water quality benefit in the stream. And the third part is what we call like our triple bottom line approach. And I think everyone is looking at these sort of measurements. We look at the economic value that greening brings to communities, improves property values, it has opportunities to create new green jobs. We looked at the quality of life benefits, beautifying neighborhoods, making them more environmentally friendly, putting something back into the communities. You know, our, our customers are paying for this. They should see where their assets are being in installed and invested. And the social benefits, you know, getting people out to the parks, because now that they're beautiful, they want to go out, they want to be there, they want to be out in the environment. So all these things made a huge difference to us. 
uh, I mentioned we do have five-year commitments. We have targets we have to make. So the one I'm showing you now is what we call our Green Acres targets. And, and that's the target where we have to we have to come back to the state and to the Environmental Protection Agency every five years and say, we have done so many hundreds of green acres. So you see we have about 750 that we have to meet in year five. And we have to show them where they are. And when we talk about achieving these green acres, we have to show that the systems are in place. We have as built for them. They're being operated. They're being maintained. So we know that they're, they're actually functioning. And we feel like we're pretty much well on the way for this target. We have completed, or at least we have verified, over 100 of what we call our green acres in place now. We have 300 that are currently in design or constructed, and we're still waiting for the O&M plans to receive. But so we feel like we're in a good place. But again, we recognize, too, that these, the designs that we're putting into the ground today may change. They may evolve, because we're going to be monitoring and trying them out over the next few years. Um, just a slide that shows some of the typical green infrastructure practices, and I think there are practices that we have seen being used all over the country. We talked about um, in that far right corner, the stormwater treatment wetlands. Really, that's something we're doing in, in our separate sewer areas more than we're doing in our sort of very urbanized communities or in our park areas. But the other ones we're pretty much laying out all over the city, giving an, us an opportunity to try these things out and coming up with a really cost-effective approach for their installation. So our, our green planning approach, since we, we do have some ambitious targets, we have looked at you know GIS parcels of all of the, the land uses in the city of Philadelphia. And we started by looking at where do we have the most opportunity, where is the collection of impervious surfaces the most, where are they low lying, or where there is a lot of drainage that is going to these parcels so we can get the best bang for our buck. And also looking to see where our partners are working. Are there capital improvement projects already in the queue for some of these locations? Because they're great opportunities to sort of leverage our investments and make these projects something better. And then the way we approach the program is really looking at the types of land uses and who our partners are. So certainly our Parks and Rec Department, you know, they're clearly on our radar. You know, we look to see where are the public parks are. They, a lot of open spaces, even recreation centers, we can use them. And they're really ideal for taking street, you know, public runoff, sidewalk runoff, and even if there's large impervious privately owned parcels, it's an opportunity for us to sort of divert that flow beneath ball fields, beneath uh, basketball courts, creating rain gardens, some of these corners, a really good opportunity for us and very visual. I think Jim and the others have mentioned how important it is for the, for the public to really gain a good understanding about how these systems work so they understand them, they value them, they take care of them. I mean, that has been one of our challenges because when you're in an, a very urban area, Rain gardens don't look quite the same as a manicured lawn, so that's an education. Where people aren't used to having a lot of green, and they think the green are creating mice, or they're attracting you know, vermin, or things that they don't like. So a lot of education you have to do up front about that. Uh, schools. Schools are a good opportunity for us. Uh, they really only constitute about 2% of the impervious area in our combined sewer areas, but again, schools are grand public places, a great opportunity to not just educate children, but all the parents and the community that live around those schools. And they're, they're very interested partners. They have swaths and swaths of you know asphalt that is our play arts. They would love to see some of these play arts greens and become an outdoor opportunity for a classroom. Vacant land. So I, I think many of you know the city of Philadelphia has probably over 40,000 some parcels of underutilized or vacant property, either city owned or privately owned. We're working with city council and many of our partners, you know, taking advantage of a vacant land bank that's being put together. And we want to make sure that we take a look at some of those parcels, certainly not taking the ones that make sense for development, but taking those parcels that, again, are low-lying and may provide a good opportunity for a stormwater management project for what's going to be developed and also to give us some time. Thank you. I'm trying to go fast. Uh, stormwater planning districts. So this is sort of like on a large scale. We're looking to see where do we have an opportunity to do a number of projects really quick because we have a lot of impervious area. So we're working right now at the stadium district where we have, you know, the Eagles, the Phillies, um, Wells Fargo Center, over 50 acres of parking lot, you know, which is sort of horrific when you go out and look at that. And so we really see it as an opportunity to work with these private partners and public partners to do some really, not, I shouldn't say quick, but stormwater master planning on a grand scale so we can get the most cost-effective benefit from that. So just began that planning initiative. Working with the streets department. Streets are about 38% of the impervious surfaces in the city. So it makes sense for us every time we put a new water main in, a new sewer in the ground, an opportunity for us to green on top, but also work with the streets department as they renew our streets. And together with them, we're creating a green streets design manual so that what we do today will happen forever. Every time a street is renewed, it's renewed in an environmentally friendly way. 
and just some typical examples of the types of tools you use for green streets. And I think you've all seen bump outs, tree trenches, and we're really getting a sense of um, how well these systems go in in a variety of locations. Uh, looking at streets, we try to make sure that we pick, again, the ones that give us the most opportunity, that are the widest, they have wide sidewalks, um, they have not a whole lot of utilities beneath the sidewalk because utilities can be a challenge. So it helps us sort of prioritize where we want to go first in those areas. Uh, we're taking advantage of our stormwater regulations. We mentioned those were implemented in 2006, require the capture of the first inch when you disturb more than 15,000 square foot of earth. Great, because it happened, you know, it requires public re or private redevelopment and public redevelopment to meet the kind of green acre goals that we're required to meet. We implemented uh, stormwater parcel base fees uh, back in 2010 and this past July. We're at 100% where we abandoned the meter charge and went totally to a parcel base charge. Uh, was not easy. Um, caused a lot of controversy, but it's it, it made sense, you know, for the most part our customers get it and it provides a lot of incentives for people who are paying high stormwater bills to retrofit their property because we do have an incentive program. We uh, looked at the City of New York who had a, a great uh, grant program around green stormwater infrastructure. Um, we talked to them about it. We were able to put something together working also with Scholar Bar to make that a, a reality. And so we have a $5 million grant program every year where we offer private property owners who can provide us some cost-effective green acres on a grand scale uh, to take advantage of that grant. It's another opportunity to get some private funding. We're also working with all the other city agencies. So for Philadelphia, it's a really great time to look, about, to look at green infrastructure, to implement a program like Green City Clean Waters because the mayor has his Green Works plan, really about making the city the, the greenest city in the nation. Um, and, and a good opportunity for us because our plan really complements what the mayor is looking to do. City planning is doing all these initiatives. A lot of partners in here are revitalizing riverbanks, getting people back to you know our, our natural amenities. So it makes perfect sense. And then the, the final part is just you know the importance for the public outreach and the communication because this is something new because people don't really understand how these systems work. We try to use every mechanism we can think about, you know, in order to get the public involved to adopt these features. We actually created an adoption program recently where a civic associations, CDCs, will provide $5,000 if they adopt the green features in their community to take a look at them, make sure they're not trash filled, because actually that's one of the first complaints we get from people is trash and they become unsightly. And it also brings buy-in from the community. So there, there are our eyes and ears. They let us know when something doesn't look right afterwards, even though we're still continuing to be responsible for the maintenance and operation. So anything you can think of. And I do want to mention, we also talked to DC for, they have a great River Smart program where they're focused on residential uh, practices. And we created something similar called Rain Check, where we're working with residential properties. They have 20% of the impervious surfaces. So not getting credit for theirs yet, but at least getting customers engaged in how we can sort of make the city a greener city and everyone can contribute to stormwater management. And that's our website if you're looking for more information and, uh, and our email. So thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Carlton Ray, the director of the Clean Rivers Project, and I want to thank the uh, fine folks at Ballard Spar, the Environmental Law Institute, the uh, Bioengineering Group, um, for having me today. It's also an honor to speak with Joanne. Uh, what a great, uh, what a great speaker and a great program here in, in uh, uh, here in Philadelphia. So I was originally uh, it was long term. Uh, 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 lived in uh, Indianapolis for for a number of years. I was an Indiana Pacers uh, fan, and I was uh, walking from the hotel this morning uh, over here with my Indiana Pacers jersey, and I was walking uh, uh, coming out of the hotel, and the first guy I saw, the actually first guy I saw out of the uh, of the hotel on the street, he said, "Man, what a nasty jersey you have on." <laughs> I said, "Wow, what a." What a city of brotherly love here. <laughs> but I also thought uh, they really love their uh, their sports teams here in this town. So uh, I uh, it was uh, it's been honored here to to, to talk about our program. So um, uh, I'd like to talk about the Clean Rivers Project. Our, our, uh, 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 the DC Waters uh, Project to improve the district waters. Um, I also like to give a little bit of comparison between us and the. Um, 
Uh, the, the speaker asked me, to, or the uh, moderator asked me to give a little bit of comparison between our two programs. I'll try to do that there at the end. So just quickly, um, this is district, the uh, District of Columbia. This is the outline of the district. Um, I, um, you can see the outline there. Um, right here is the Potomac River on the west side. It's the uh, boundary on the west side. The Anacostia River is a very slow-moving stream. It's affected by tide. Uh, down in the southern part of the district, and then we have Rock Creek uh, that runs on kind of north, uh, north, uh, east to southwest, and discharges into the Potomac. Uh, about a third of the district is combined sewers. Uh, about two thirds of the district is uh, MS4, or separated sewers. We have about um, 52, 53 overflows on the uh, that's basically discharges uh, um, raw sewage, combined sewage every time it rains. Uh, we have uh, right here is the, the mall area, so the White House, the, the Capitol. Um, those are all in combined sewer areas and overflow periodically, um, practically every time it rains into the Anacostia River. Uh, we have a large number of CSOs on the Rock Creek, but a relatively uh, small overflow volume. Majority of the overflow volume comes, uh, overflows uh, out of the uh, downtown area into the Anacostia River. So they basically gets the brunt of the overflow or the sewage overflow there in the district. This is our timeline for addressing the, uh, the sewage overflow project through the development of our long-term control plan, our CSO long-term control plan. Just like Philadelphia started back in, uh, in the 90s, um, we uh, basically dra drafted a uh, long-term control plan, CSO long-term control plan in 2001. It was finalized in 2002 with lots of public input, but that was a long time ago with uh, with a, with a uh, probably lack of understanding what the benefits of green infrastructure were uh, associated with that, and um, so it was primarily focused on gray infrastructure, uh, both from a regulatory standpoint. Um, 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 they they were pretty adamant uh, about focusing on gray um, as well as acceptable by the by the public, and so. That was eventually, uh, with the understanding uh, that met water quality standards, it was eventually entered into cons federal consent decree in March 23rd, 2005, uh, into federal court as a federal consent decree. Um, a couple years ago, 2007, or maybe it's a little bit more than that now, uh, we had some new nitrogen issues that, uh, uh, that we needed to implement there at the plant. We modified the long-term control plan uh, uh, to address that. We needed to take about a million pounds of nitrogen, and so our plan addresses that as well. Um, currently, we're obviously we're implementing the uh, long-term control plan. We renamed ourselves the CSO long-term control plan to the DC Clean Rivers Project because people were like saying, "Huh, what's what's a CSO long-term control plan?" <laughs> So we needed to, um, again, uh, we're raising rates pretty drastically there in dis the district. And so um, it was important for us to make a connection here, why, why those rates, where the money was going to, and, and the benefits associated with, the, uh, with our program. And currently, we're uh, currently negotiating a modification to the consent decree, trying to incorporate more green infrastructure into our original approach. And those, have been, uh, those negotiations have been difficult at best. So this is the uh, plan um, that currently uh, exists right now. Uh, it's a, a primarily uh, based on a uh, gray infrastructure approach of capturing sewage. Um, uh, this is, uh, again, just from a perspective standpoint, we're in the southern part of the district, uh, Blue Plains Treatment Plant, it's the world's largest wastewater treatment plant. It's a cool tour. If you ever come to D.C., we'd love to have you uh, tour the facility. It's a great uh, Great, uh, um, lots of information, lots of uh, uh, instructional information that's going on and different things that are going on to plant, um, which we really encourage you to come, come tour. But it's in the southern part of the district, and basically we're building a tunnel system that will uh, start from Blue Plains, go north along Anacostia River, and go up to the northern part of the district. Up here in the northern part of the district, that we've had significant flooding since 1800s, uh, um, 1880s, 1890s was the northeast boundary sewer that was built up there to serve that area. Even at that time, the engineers and, and the contractors who were putting that in were noticing that it was undersized at that time. And so we have the, all these sewers up there. Basically, every time it rains, we, we have a kind of a whole operational group goes out there and just trying to uh, make sure that 
prevent flooding from occurring. They're trying to mitigate the amount of flooding that's occurring. Last year, uh, during July and September, we had sto four storms. Talk about the intensity of the storms, how they're again becoming more intense. We had four storms that uh, basically dumped a lot of rain, a lot of water on a couple of different neighborhoods of uh, Bloomingdale and LaDroit Park. And uh, they had sewage that was coming out of, um, uh, coming out of their houses. Uh, it was running down the streets. It was just a, a just a terrible problem up there. This project right here, the the um, excuse me, with the uh, large tunnel system. It's a 23 foot diameter tunnel. It's about 100 feet uh, under underground. Uh, we'll mitigate. We'll reduce that. Um, um, reduce the uh, the chance of any kind of flooding to occur. We've oversized that uh, the tunnel system about 20% to capture, trying to get the climate change, trying to ca capture the uh, climate change uh, issue there as, uh, as one of our previous speakers were talking about. And then over the west side, um, uh, excuse me, we have a tunnel over here that's being proposed and then one tunnel up here in Rock Creek. These are the tunnels that we would really like to see possibly shortened or even eliminated uh, through green infrastructure. We think we have a, a good approach for both of those uh, with the goal of mitigating the, uh, or at least eliminating the uh, gray infrastructure on the uh, Rock Creek and significantly reducing the size of uh, Potomac. At the same time as uh, in constructing um, green infrastructure in lieu of the gray infrastructure. So this is uh, one thing that uh, a little bit different uh, in, uh, in DC. We have uh, we start out with about three billion gallons, a little over three billion gallons of raw sewage, combined sewage that overflowed on an annual basis into our three streams: the Anacostia River, Potomac, and Rock Creek. Uh, about again, two thirds of it were uh, uh, overflows into the Anacostia. About a third of it overflows into the Potomac uh, River. Uh, again, we have a very small volume that actually overflows into Rock Creek. Our goal, because the Anacostia takes the brunt of most of the sewage, our overall goal of reducing, reducing the amount of sewage overflow is 98%, uh, with a goal of system-wide of 96%. And so we're going to take a number of overflow, uh, overflows from 82, uh, when we started with this whole program, down to two um, uh, of raw sewage or combined sewage overflows. Um, and this will be only occurring to the real significant wet weather events. Um, and then four for the remaining areas, except for Piney Branch up in Rock Creek that we're going to reduce down to one overflow. We looked at, um, we looked at the number of uh, CSO programs across the uh, country and looking at what kind of, the, with a component have green infrastructure. Again, our focus was initially on gray infrastructure. We had a very small, relatively small amount, uh, three million, get three million dollars worth of uh, gray infrastructure or green infrastructure that was incorporated in our original pro uh, proposal, and so we went and, and did a research study uh, looking at all the different uh, different programs across the uh, uh, across the uh, country. Um, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, if you can look, one thing is on the on the long-term control plan time frame. Most of the current uh, uh, consent decrees out there or agreed orders are getting 25 years. We had a 20 year program. Um, and again, this is understanding that green infrastructure takes a little bit longer. You know, we got to grow it versus uh, actually building it and uh, um, gray infrastructure and, and uh, be done with it. Uh, green, green infrastructure is a, it's a more of a takes time to grow it to make sure it, uh, it gets our desired results. Again, we have a very high uh, capture rate or uh, excuse me of around 96% capture rate for, uh, for the district uh, and uh, meet core water quality standards. That's where we're at right now. And, and our goal for this modification from gray to, uh, to a hybrid approach of gray green um, is that similar, similar characteristics that we're going to get to that 96% capture rate. And then, uh, obviously, we're in the negotiations uh, with our uh, fellow brethren, uh, US EPA and Department of Justice, so we don't know what the end up uh, dollar amount is going to be for the green parks yet. So this is our approach. Again, on the Anacostia River uh, uh, tunnel system, that one on the, on the east side of the district, we're moving forward aggressively and building that uh, with gray infrastructure. Again, one of the uh, tremendous benefits is that, uh, that it's going to reduce the uh, the flooding issues, uh, the amount of uh, uh, flooding issues we have, and then also uh, greatly diminish the amount of sewage overflows into the Anacostia. 
on the Rock Creek and Potomac that's given, given us a little more time to address that. And we're going to uh, basically have somewhere with, uh, what we'd like to do is on, on, the, on the Rock Creek is they, well, our goal is to basically go completely green and then possibly with a hybrid solution on the Potomac. This is our uh, tunnel system. Uh, it's $1.8 billion, uh, a lot of money, um, and uh, we're moving forward aggressively. Lots of uh, projects are either in, uh, in construction or uh, kind of getting close to completion design. All the work from RFK State, excuse me, all the work on RFK Stadium down to the Blue Plains has to be completed by 2018. Um, that's uh, only a few years away, so we're, uh, I, I wake up dreaming about this stuff, go to bed dreaming about this stuff. It's, uh, all these projects uh, must get built uh, by that time. The flooding problem up in the northeast part of the district, we were allowed to uh, have up to 2025 to construct that. But because there's been such an outcry to address the flooding problem that there, we've sped this northeast boundary tunnel to be built by 2022, which is only three years, but that's a, that's a lot. It's a $600 million job, so it's pretty good pretty significant uh, increase in time. And then also we've already started constructing there uh, at First Street Tunnel, basically awarded that, that tunnel right there. But there's a picture of the Lady Bird Johnson. Uh, Lady Bird uh, was our uh, name of our tunnel boring machine and basically we're mining out up underneath the uh, Potomac River as we're going north. So our GI approach um, for um, has some key elements. To, First, we want to apply technologies uh, where they make most sense. Uh, this again, this is for our modification uh, to our consent decree. We want to develop coordinated standards and policies with the district. Uh, Joanne talked about uh, her work with uh, in the various district or various uh, city agencies. Consider new procurement methods. I think that's important. Promote innovation and derive benefits. Uh, from the, uh, the MS4 program, and I'll talk about each one of those. I also talk about, uh, want to say, there's probably a six element too, that um, is that um, green, green infrastructure needs to be considered by us and by others as this long-term approach and that we need to make sure that we have the necessary folks in place to maintain the facilities for a long period of time, not just for two years, not just five years, but 25 and 50 years and 100 years. And uh, we, we need to get a mindset for us um, and uh, that we need to make sure that there's finances and, and that there, there's money in place the long term to make sure this is a supported uh, effort. So you don't go out there and just see a bunch of dead, dead uh the plantings out there, um, it, and this is something I want to I want to um, make sure folks uh, realize that you need to be thinking long term when you're thinking uh, building this stuff. So, so here's the first one: so apply technologies where we make most sense. We think uh, up in Piney Branch where there's uh, a fairly low density area, low to moderate CSOs. There's plenty of plenty of area to do a lot of green infrastructure in this area. We think this is a uh, a uh, ideal candidate, and we uh, our goal is again is to get rid of this tunnel, this this tunnel right here on the Piney Branch, on the upper part of the Potomac. Uh, again, uh, uh, if you've been on the CNO Canal, somebody rode their bicycle. Uh, was telling us uh, before at lunchtime that the, they had rode their bicycle from uh, from Pittsburgh over here to D.C. Uh, along the CNO Canal. One of the C one of the um, one of our CSOs is there on the canal, uh, adjacent to the canal. And so this would be an ideal place. We Again, this is an ideal place uh, for green infrastructure. And, and basically, where we initially had the tunnel coming up to serve that area, we believe that we can uh, eliminate that and do the, all that work uh, with green infrastructure. And then over here on the lower part of, uh, of the Potomac, there was um, basically, if you've been to DC, the Watergate building, the Kennedy Center, that general area, Excuse me. We have several uh, very large sewers coming in from uh, Maryland, Virginia, Dulles Airport. Lots of sewage coming into that general area, and this may make sense right here to uh, do a uh, do a um, do some gray infrastructure um, in, in addition to the green infrastructure. Um, the uh, second one is the coordinated standards with uh, with the various in the district policies. Um, we've got a lot of folks working on it. We just need to make sure we continue to work together. We've done a good job so far. Uh, there are lots of different uh, players here. And again, it's just from our standpoint, we just need to be talking to each other, 
the mayor's got a great vision for the for sustainability uh, for the district. We want to make sure that we're all talking together, make sure we're all coordinated. And again, so far today, we've done a pretty good job with that. And again, the, uh, we just want to make sure that the, uh, that the, that the developing the standards are just all coordinated. Uh, consider new procurement methods. Uh, in DC, we have we allow design build to be utilized, the design build procurement. I think it's real important to bring in the contractor into this process. The engineers will go, Ugh. but uh, but uh, it's. I think for our standpoint, we see value to that, and I encourage uh, agencies in different uh, states who do not have the ability to use uh, design build to think about it. We've done that with our tunneling. Uh, uh, projects they've they've worked out quite well to date. Uh, bringing the contractor into the uh, the process, we have a series of collaboration meetings with the shortlisted uh, teams. Uh, they're in confidential settings, and so there are lots of uh, ideas can be gained by both parties. We also the the two losing we shortlist down to three teams. The two losing teams uh, after we shortlist them will also receive a stipend, uh, so they don't go away uh, without uh, a little bit of money there. But again, we believe this is value added. Um, uh, just like Philly, we, uh, we implemented a design challenge. We also uh, had a component of constructability aspect to it as well. We uh, were awarding uh, a little over a million dollars in prizes for a, both from design, uh, coming up with good design elements as well as uh, being constructible. Um, and um, that's, and what we want to do is use those ideas and, and and uh, in, encourage uh, um, our designers to use those as time progresses. And um, we just received um, um, a series of um, submittals on that and had a good, uh, and lots of great ideas have come out of that, uh, out of this process. And also the uh, MS4, uh, the, uh, basically uh, the separated um, storm sewer system has a um, permit, excuse me, um, it has a has a permit that um, that basically overlaps somewhat. Uh, you would think it uh, be separated. You remember that that uh, that um, map of uh, district where the purple area was the combined area and the two outside areas were the separated areas. The district has has worked with us and basically have incorporated the MS4 guidelines not just for the separated areas but also for the uh, combined areas. And so what our goal is to utilize the benefits from that area, from those, uh, uh, from that strategy, into the overall uh, approach that we're using for for addressing the combined sewer overflow volume. So what we like to do is basically on an annual basis look at how much uh, much technology or how much uh, developments occurred uh, using the MS4 guidance, uh, the 1.2 if it's captured the 1.2 inches uh, for more than 5,000 square feet. Uh, how much, uh, if, if that work's been done in the combined area, uh, take, uh, um, utilize that in our overall approach. And um, let's see. So finally, are we doing okay on time? Yes. Okay. So finally, just uh, quickly on the uh, DC water contrast with Philadelphia. Uh, again, uh, we were blessed, blessed to have a federal consent decree. Um, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> You should have held out, Carlton. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Philadelphia had a good strategy there. Uh, state, they uh, basically had a state and EPA administrative order. Um, basically, uh, our, our consent decree was uh, signed before there was widespread recognition of the benefits of green infrastructure. Um, this, uh, it was the uh, Philadelphia's approach and their order was uh, signed after widespread recognition of green infrastructure. Uh, we're independent authority. We got peeled off back in 96 uh, from uh, the district government. So we're a quasi independent um, utility. Uh, the, the Philadelphia, uh, I'm sure they feel blessed sometimes and not so blessed other times, uh, but <laughs> okay. being part of the city government. Um, we have uh, we're, we have a very high degree of control. Uh, we're uh, that driven by water quality standards, environmental groups, and EPA. I'd say a little bit less on Philadelphia. The gray and green. Uh, we're trying to focus on the strength of each. Uh, I think Philadelphia's done a marvelous job on really focusing on green, going being very aggressive with that. 
with, uh, with limited grade. I really commend uh, with Philadelphia on that approach. Um, one thing here is, uh, you know, must change the consent decree to allow GI versus uh, as part of the plan before, before finalizing administrative order. We've, we've had a difficult time dealing with um, Department of Justice and other folks with the, with the concept of a deal's a deal, a deal. And now you're trying to change it. And, you know, what we're trying to do is not turn 180 degrees uh, with our approach. We're trying to turn, say, five, like 45 degrees. We're still going down the path here. We're going to do great stuff here. But it's, uh, um, it's sometimes, um, um, like, our, like our keynote speaker said, you know, it's, it's difficult sometimes for folks who are down in the trenches to basically change their mindset uh, to, to get this uh, and accomplish this. And so that's been a kind of a difficult task for us to hoe. So, so next steps, we um, want to finalize our negotiations with, with US EPA. Um, they're, they're actually going, doing better now. We, uh, uh, after, uh, after we, uh, I used to have a full head of hair last year, but now it's gone. Um, no, uh, they're, they're doing better. And uh, we're basically completing their challenge awards uh, that I mentioned just a little while ago, uh, again, coordinating with our district agencies. And uh, also on the early action projects, what, what we're really interested in doing, once we um, um, modify the consent decree, get the consent decree modified, we want to hit the uh, ground running on early action projects with green infrastructure. And so we have already started doing design on those projects uh, in the Piney Branch area. So with that, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlton. Uh, while we're on the topic of sports in the World Series, let me just uh, give you a quote from that great, great baseball agent, Scott Morris. There's no contract or consent decree that can't be unnegotiated. <laughs> But seriously, we, we, we know that you're in uh, discussions with the EPA to try to incorporate more green infrastructure. I think what's important with that is, and Joanne is such a great communicator of the message, is that green infrastructure is, is much more cost effective when used wisely and be blended in with what you're doing with the gray. It, it, and that is compelling when you look at what the rate payer is paying. Because when, as a bond lawyer putting these uh, financings together, we have to have bond issues that are feasible, so we have to have rates that can are affordable. Right. Otherwise, there's no feasibility. So that, I think that's a key thing, and I'm, I'm really sorry the EPA isn't here, so you could have given a direct pitch. We, we did invite representatives of the EPA, and uh, no knock on them because of the sequestration and the government shutdown. We weren't able to uh, add some of the EPA folks to our agenda, which we would have loved to have, have done. But anyway, I want to open it up for questions for our two panelists on the tale of two cities, uh, what you'd like to know about either D.C. or Philadelphia. Yes. We had uh, good, good presentations. The, the two panel discussions we've had so far, one was really focused on, I'll say, climate change-induced phenomenon and how we might arrest that or control that. And then this is obviously more regulatory equivalent at your level of applied to both of what you're doing. Uh, perhaps being forced to do. My question is, how, how much um, do you consider climate change in the decisions that you make and the direction that you take in your respective utilities? Can we go first? You want to go first? Sure. Oh, geez. Um, certainly, you know, climate change uh, is a huge topic for us. And with both the green and the gray, we are ensuring that we incorporate climate change models, thinking about the resiliency of these systems. We're doing 50-year master planning efforts for our water and wastewater sites for the more traditional systems, including our plants and, you know, and our piping. So we recognize that there may be changes that are required along both riverfronts and in our tributary stream systems, too, regarding outfalls and potentially for pumping stations and that type of thing. So we certainly have our eye on what that might mean. But with the green infrastructure, we do recognize that I mean, green can only do so much. It's not a flood relief. It's more like providing the additional capacity to our systems. But we're looking at the kind of vegetation that may thrive. You know, that may change with temperature changes. And so that's, that's certainly part of our model. As we're doing you know, a repetitive evaluation on these systems, we're going to be looking at what's thriving really well, what do we have to change, looking at the intense rainstorm. I think somebody mentioned, you know, after one big storm, you might have some of this stuff blown out. We have to be ready to replace it. I mean, that all has to go into the sort of O&M cost of green infrastructure, because our commitment is to make sure that these systems work or replace so that they're whatever replaces them are working to the same degree for at least 45, 50 years. And that's a lot of time, a long time. 
for you know a, a rain garden to be functioning. So climate change is a huge component for us. So adaptation is a big part of it mm -hmm. because this is evolving. And, and uh, I wanted to give uh, Carlton a chance to respond to the question as well. Yeah. Uh, so basically, from our standpoint, it's uh, very much uh, right in the front uh, for uh, addressing all the issues, uh, both on gray infrastructure as well as on, on, on green. Um, for gray infrastructure, I alluded to that we've oversized the uh, tunnel system um, and also basically the frequency or the uh, peak, frequent, or peak rates coming into the tunnel system as well. I think that's uh, critical. Folks are interested in that type of stuff, come talk to us. But, um, and then um, also we have the ability to um, expand the, uh, the pumping system down at the plant and, and treatment down the plant. So we're, right now we're sized at 225 MGD. We can double that or actually a little bit larger to, to 500 MGD with a pump station um, as well as um, – uh, so our thought is that we need to be thinking about that in the future here. Modify, you know, if, if it needs to be uh, using the tunnel system more as a conveyance system and, uh, and treating that water, recycling that water and putting it into the Potomac, uh, much cleaner than it is right now. So uh, from a gray infrastructure, that's approach. And then the green infrastructure, you know, it's just everybody, uh, you know, in, in, in the district, you know, you go down one street and there's – you know, no trees, and then you go into another street, uh, go into another street, and we have trees where it's five or ten degrees cooler, and where it's under under trees. And we need to, again, focus, get everybody focused. And, and we've done a, a, the district's done a marvelous job, and the, uh, with good uh, with good leadership from our mayor and George, but uh, um, focusing on just all the benefits associated with green, and and uh, and and keeping that first and foremost in everybody's mind as we're moving forward on that. So. Open that up. Uh, other questions here. Yeah, probably in oversizing the uh, tunnel system, what did you look at in terms of like, for example, was it a daily rainfall or hourly rainfall or storage projection? Yeah, um, so basically both um, um, at peak intensity storms, we were looking at peak intensity coming into the tunnel system um, using. Um, um, you know, using safety factors on top of what what we were expecting here um, um, for for those for those um, for the uh, for coming into the storm. Uh, so um, I probably need to let uh, the uh, engineers tell you some more about uh, how they oversize it. Um, but basically, that's uh, that's our initial approach there. So yes. Driven by, by climate change, that's not their, their 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 motivator. So I think the question that we have for you is: Does is, is climate change seen as a reason for the movement to green infrastructure, or are you moving to green infrastructure, which is helping on the issue of climate change, which you're not really talking about climate change as what's motivating your actions? Is that for you or it's for both of us? Okay. Right. I guess what I'm saying is climate change really one of the policy drivers of the infrastructure. Right. Mm -hmm. For green infrastructure. Right. right. Um, no, I, I think for what we've been really uh, careful about the message for green infrastructure, that it's not going to resolve uh, flooding. And you know, so that's a real concern for us. When we put green infrastructure in a community especially communities that have experienced a lot of flooding, particularly our combined sewer areas where they're getting basement backups because the sewers are surcharging into their basements and their street flooding. That takes, um, that, that's a different issue. That's a conveyance, getting water out of the community and conveying it quickly to the river versus grabbing it, storing it, letting it infiltrate. So we, we try to be really clear about green infrastructure is something we're looking at to provide additional capacity to our existing system for flood problems, and, and we certainly, as the city, we recognize that we are having certainly a ramping up of these high intensity rainstorms, and we do have, as you have, neighborhoods that go underwater during some of these incredibly intense rainstorms. For more and more, these, more and more these days. More and more, yeah. yeah. Since 2004, we started seeing a few events almost every year. And for those communities, we're really looking, very expensive, but they're more traditional gray solutions. We'd love to do, I mean, when we talk about doing that, it had to be green on top. Again, it provides us some a little bit of additional capacity, but um, for true intense rainstorms with flooding, 
you have to do something much larger. Yeah, let me, let me add, add my own perspective on that. I think from a political standpoint, uh, the councilman who gets uh, complaints about the neighborhood flooding every time there's a big rainstorm, what is driving it with the, with the voters is flooding problems, mm -hmm. problems in their neighborhoods. What is driving it, I think, from a legal perspective, and I think you're right on with the question, is this clean water compliance. You have EPA with a list of around 800 cities and regions that have to comply. They're under mandate. They're being, uh, they're being whipped into signing a consent decree and, and putting a plan out that everyone can live with. So what's driving it really is compliance and not thinking more broadly ahead, as Jim said this morning, about where we're going and, and what broader issues we need to address. Bobby. Yes. There are very few references to the word climate change on the 10,000 friends mm. website. Um, and basically they say yes, because we want to deal with people. People resonate with flooding issues. Uh, they resonate with uh, the storms are getting a little, a little, a little more serious. So, so there's this sense that, that they're seeing the implications of climate change. And we're, we're able to change some policies, but in the end, the macro issue of the, of the changing climate isn't isn't really being you know, being addressed. So, I mean, my question was more whether people are beginning to say we need to do these things because my basement is flooding, but also because we have a responsibility. The climate change issue is probably going to be resolved more locally than it is globally. So. So, I mean, I thought it was a great leading mm -hmm. question to sort of say, here we are at a conference where we're talking climate change and, right. and, and, green, and green infrastructure, yet they're, they're connected in the most sort of in, imprecise way. They are, they are in, all, in all of our panels are designed to tie all of this together. When I heard uh, Wendy and Alice speaking and putting the slides up, compelling slides on the, on the financial uh, compelling reasons for this as well as the environmental reasons. If you did that with any kind of a public audience, they would probably fall asleep, quite honestly, because they, they, they've been taught by the media and taught by conservatives and people who don't believe in climate change and don't think it's, they think it's a stall of hoax. So that is one of the challenges, just the communication challenge. And, and Joanne is a master at that. Carson, you've done a great job today on that, too. Getting the word out, this is not simply about getting an EPA mandate solved, but doing something we've got to do if we're, our planet's going to survive. So uh, with that, I, uh, I'd like to uh, invite more questions for any of the panelists, but we're at the break point, I believe. Uh, Julia is signaling me it's now time for a break so you can get a refreshment. And we will convene back here with the next panel at uh, 3.15. It's a good meeting you today here. Come, come.